you got two crabs confronting each other here, so. Oh, that's just light reflection from the camera. Is there an up-to-date book on the geology and the biology of hydrothermal wet only found books from the 90s? Uh, there's actually, we, I, I also have a, a, with my colleague Deb Kelly, an annual reviews of geology and uh, that was published a, a few years ago that's still probably one of the most up-to-date that blends the geology with the biology. It's a hundred page annual review article. But nothing like your book, Planets and Life? Uh, there's no book like that, no. In fact, the even the last book on biology was published in 2000, and so it's not. You know, there's no real synthesis. It's a kind of a complicated subject. But the annual review article probably is cited a lot for that. If you want, send me an email. I think I have it. I can send it to you. I don't know. I guess we can we can start. These are some uh, what we call. Spider crabs, they're actually the genus is Chianocetes. Uh, they are deep sea crab, a very interesting animal. Actually, one of the first things I did as a postdoc uh, when I got to, to Oregon State was go out to sea with a, a graduate student who was studying these kind of deep sea crabs. And I'll just tell you a little story. I, we, we, she was collecting lots of them, like, you know, animal people do, so they can count them and size them and measure them. And I had noticed that the female crabs of this group were just covered with black spots all over the place. And there were pits in the shell. It was something a little story. And this really, well, this is kind of intriguing. And, and so I had taken these crabs and put them on ice, some of them, so I can study and see if there was a bacterial infection on the shell. And what I had noticed uh, when I, you know, had them on ice and I took them down into, you know, a little place on the ship that was dark and I opened up the ice chest, they were glowing. So all these little black spots were, were luminescent bacteria that were eating into the kite and shell. And so this was interesting because only the female had them, the males didn't. And, uh, and you know, this is, this is deep and dark. There's no way to, to see anything, but these guys do have, have certain functional eyes. Well, anyway, the bottom line is because it's so stressful to be in the deep sea that there's a process that crabs and all uh, crustaceans go through, which we call ecdysis, which means as they grow, they have to eliminate their shell and then redo a shell. So you probably, those of you from the east coast have had soft shell Blue crabs, for example, that's crabs going through ecdysis and then they produce a really soft shell and then they harden it. Uh, the females, because they're spending so much energy in making eggs, that after they reach maturity, they don't go through ecdysis, so they keep their shell for almost their whole adult life. And so it has a greater chance of infection. So I wrote a paper on this and my hypothesis was that the female uh, that had the most glowing on it was the one that had the best chance of reproducing with the males because they could actually find them. So it was a, so here, here's a case where, you know, you really have this really hot glowing female crab that just attracts all the females. And this has turned out to be potentially uh, correct, even though it was very speculative at the, at the time. So you just never know what you're gonna run into. <sighs> anyway. This actually works this time. This is the, uh, the hagfish again, and note, note the slime in the back. And there's one hagfish that's starting to completely incorporate itself into this slime. And so now the, the whole thing is just incorporated into a slime sack. And it does it that fast. And if, if you look at a hag, you know, you don't, I hate hagfish. <laughs> I pull them up, they're awful. You just look at them and they just, slime comes out. They hate you for, but you know, they're about this big and there's, I don't know, 20 or 30 uh, slime glands on either side. So it's capable of just 
serious slime production. You know who likes this stuff? Japanese. I mean, I, hmm? Japanese. Exactly. They yeah. love this stuff. <laughs> so, what happened? What ha yeah, that's a really good comment because when uh, uh, Japan has Jamstack, which is the big deep sea program that they have, and they have their own submersibles. And it was in the mid-1990s that they, they formed Jamstack and had a dedication and invited a few of us scientists from around the world to come for the dedication. And they had this incredible banquet. I mean, you know, like 30 courses and French wines. It was wonderful. But one of the courses was a bowl of slime. You know, they, they put it in front of me. And, you know, I thought, what's this? And I, you know, my Japanese, oh, that's real delicacy. Oh, <laughs> this is wonderful stuff. And they were just eating it with tremendous gusto. And I tried it. It was just awful. <laughs> so, you know, my Japanese colleague took it and ate it. But then I found out it was hagfish slime. So, <laughs> I don't know, you know, there's, there's probably protein in it, but it's pretty grim. I mean, you have to... You have to be real hardy to eat that. You know, I come from an Italian background where you eat raw everything, but not slime. <laughs> so what I'm going to try to accomplish today, even though I've wasted a few minutes already telling stories, which is one of my uh, bad points, I think, is to talk about the Lost City biofilm really as a model for the last common universal ancestor. This is where I'm really going with the Lost City biofilm. And I'm really making this a much shorter presentation than I normally would do. This is the, the Lost City. And it's just, as I mentioned to you before, you know, around these outer yellow edges, there's a lot of microorganisms that live in this temperature range. But when you get into this temperature and high pH range, there's only one kind of organism. It's a coxy. And before I get into this, I had mentioned biofilms. I wanted to say something about biofilms. And so probably the dominant lifestyle of microbes in most environments are living as these big uh, concentrated communities of microbes. And the degradation of organic polymers, particularly in the absence of oxygen, invariably take place by biofilms. So bunches of organisms. Uh, in an anaerobic sediment, for example, a sediment without any oxygen, and you throw cellulose or crab shell chitin or some big polymer in that, there may be 30 organisms that colonize that piece of chitin or cellulose, and working together, they'll eventually take it all the way to methane. So, so the lifestyle of all symbionts, uh, if you're an animal that actually has symbionts, they have millions and millions and millions of these organisms that form biofilms. Uh, Syntrose is a, something I was hoping to talk about and have it, and that is you can take totally impossible metabolisms that are, do not fit Gibbs free energy at all. You can't do them. I'll give an example is if you take methane and you want to anaerobically oxidize it to CO2, you, you have a, a, a sort of a plus delta G. It just will always never go in that direction. But if you have another organism to pull the protons off of that, then it's feasible. And so it requires two organisms to actually anaerobically degrade uh, methane, for example. And there are lots of, lots of examples of that. Uh, the biggest interest in biofilms and one of the largest chunks of money coming out of NIH for research is, is in uh, human pathogens. And so this is what a biofilm is. It's a community at an interface. It could be solid, water solid, a multi-layer growth of cells on some sort of support surface. And invariably, they produce a lot of polysaccharides or a lot of complex sugars that coat them. This is the Lost City biofilm on a scanning electron microgram. So essentially a stromatolite, like Jim talked about, is a biofilm. And, but even the way organisms grow and make colonies, any one of these colonies uh, represents uh, you know, 100 million or, or more microorganisms to make a visible colony. But some of these, like this particular Pseudomonas, produces a, a biofilm. 
Acid mine drainage at pH 1 is a big biofilm also of organisms. So there's a lot of examples in the environment. Some of the properties, uh, again, they can form on any surface. Uh, it can be a single species or a really complex community. Uh, it's interesting, they maintain complex gradients, they, the fusion channels, they do a lot of interesting things, and I'll show you some pictures. One of the most interesting things that they do, and one that has really revolutionized the way we think about microorganisms and multicellularity, is they talk to each other. This is quorum sensing. So you get a lot of organisms together, and they produce an array of chemical signals that result in uh, controlling organisms around them to do certain things, and I'll show you some of that. Uh, we also find out that uh, under when they form a biofilm, they have very much increased survivability. This is something that I've been talking a lot about with my colleagues on, on committees dealing with planetary protection. Because we're not, I'm not so much interested in individual organisms, it's the biofilms that are extremely resistant uh, to all the normal stresses that will actually kill a single organism, including growing at, 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 uh, and surviving at high temperatures. The other thing that we'll talk about is that in biofilms, uh, there's a tremendous amount of, of, of sexual exchange that goes on in a biofilm. Uh, so you really increase, because you're in such close proximity to each other, that you really have a lot of, 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 of that. And many people are, are, have either died or come close to dying because of biofilms. They're very, very prevalent as pathogens, and because of the the complex carbohydrate coating, they're resistant to antibiotics, for example. Uh, I personally almost died in 07 from a biofilm. I, I wasn't going to let a microbe kill me, but it was just, it just it happened from a, I won't tell you the story, but it's a very interesting that experience. Uh, it led to our hmm? imagination. It led to our imagination. Yeah. <laughs> so, this is biofilm formation, so microbes generally for one reason or another, but sometimes starvation or there's nothing available or they're stressed or that they think that you're going to try to kill them because you're going to try to, you're going to, try to uh, hitchhike a ride in, into outer space. They're, you know, they're eventually going to uh, 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 go onto a surface and when they go onto a surface they form all this sugar matrix to cover them. And then, as a result of quorum sensing, they can come up with very complex structures. This allows fluid to circulate and disperse. And this is kind of a classical example of, and, and this is just one species. It can swim around, it lands, and then part of the matrix looks like this. These are the same cells, and then other cells uh, are cells that can actually either swim away or come back. And in the process of growing, they make these really incredible uh, mushroom-like structures. They are, in fact, microstromatolites, exactly like them. And you will see the layers and everything, except that they are in micrometer scales. Uh, so they're, they're really amazing. And we're seeing this. This, again, is, a, a, is, is one of the newer areas in microbiology, and it's driven primarily by human pathogens but it's gotten those of us in ecology very, very interested in them. This is a matrix type of composition. The cells are held together by this exopolysaccharide, it's called, which are sugars. And 70 to 90 percent of the organic matter uh, in a biofilm is non-cellular, based on this particular material. And this is just some that are differentially stained uh, so that you can see uh, protein uh, and lipids and here you can see the green as DNA and RNA, the red as lipids, and all the blue as polysaccharides. So that's the dominant. And just to give you some idea of where we find them, for example, this is a vent animal, a scale worm, that has a huge biofilm of, of sulfur bacteria on it. So all that hair is sulfur bacteria. Uh, this is stromatolites again. And even in some bacterial colonies, you can see how complicated they can be. This is a single organism, and at the very tips of this growth is a, a uh, you can see kind of a circle. That's what is called a swarming group of microbes 
So at the very end are the, are the organisms that are modal, and they move this colony in this sort of centric style. Uh, they're you know, fascinating structures to see how it works. The tube worm, giant tube worm, and I mentioned this trophosome, uh, where uh, this is a really interesting animal. It would be fun if, if I talked about symbiosis to talk about it from its larval stage to here. But this is a huge biofilm with millions and millions of microbes in there that are oxidizing sulfide uh, and in the process I mentioned producing organic material. So biofilms are very prevalent. And I'm not sure how much I want to do this, but quorum sensing uh, Colonial microbes exploit these really elaborate uh, uh, systems of intracellular communication. And it takes the form of chemical signals, and signals elicit a wide range of, of physiological changes. What I'm interested in this is that there's now over 30 chemical language uh, that microbes already use. And I've been very interested in the degree to which a level of intelligence can actually happen within a community of, of microbes. Let's say if we have four or five billion years of evolution and we don't form a eukaryote, uh, what can these guys do? They're fairly sophisticated. <laughs> right now, most of the work that we have looked at is involved in symbiosis, pathogenicity, the bioluminescence. I mean, I don't know if, how many of you are know about bioluminescent animals, but most of the bioluminescence is caused by bacteria, and there are really uh, interesting relationships between the bacteria and the host. A lot of interesting stories that can, can, we can, one can talk about. But there's a lot of different uh, things that go on, including bacteria and eukaryotic communications that go on. I just want to show you just some of the level of interesting compounds involved in language of the microbial world. Uh, so these are the, what we call homoserine lactone moieties. They're basically straight hydrocarbons. Uh, some are branched, uh, some are ring structure, uh, but all of these are chemical signals in one group of bacteria. In another group of bacteria, they're, pep they're really strange peptides. All these letters stand for a different amino acid. So you have this really two sets of very complex languages. And then recently, a universal language uh, item came out. The very first, note this is a boron. This is the first organoboron compound ever found. And it, what it is is a universal signaling. It, it, rather than these, which are very specific to specific organisms and specific activity, this one can affect a, a great number. And one of my colleagues has found the gene for this in an archaea, even. So it's... Uh, I'm just pointing out, this is some of the bizarre stuff. And just simply the way, the way this goes, when an organism forms a biofilm, it makes these uh, signaling compounds, which signal the rest of the organism to make the polysaccharide. It's, that's just a, a very simple one. So what it is that I really want to, I'm giving you this background because uh, I'm going to build, try to, in my own head, build a lot around biofilms. So the possible importance of biofilms in the origin of life and early evolution, this is the hypothesis, that the last universal common ancestor was a biofilm. And why do I say that? Because I think the first living entity was some sort of pre-cell that didn't have enough information uh, to actually grow on its own, so there was a sort of obligate mutualism. They were dependent on each other and very likely used hydrogen as the energy source. <laughs> Uh, this is not a, a, a new idea about pre-cells. I actually said it in my original life paper in 1985. So this is something that I was a postdoc thinking about. The earliest metabolic networks developed in what I call an organo or biochemical film, more like an eventually a ribofilm. Uh, and the reason is, is that you can do a lot of things if you're within a biofilm. You're not going to lose... Uh, metabolites, and you also can have exchange between one organ and another. So that as a result of being in a biofilm, horizontal gene transfer in the earliest biofilms resent, resulted in the unity of biochemistry through the selection, homogenation of the most fit genes and gene sets, which is something you have to happen. But more importantly, in order to get a cell, 
increasing the size of the genome so that a single organism has enough genetic information to actually go off on its own. I mean, think about it. It's not trivial. I'll give you an example of why this is not trivial. Bob Shapiro, I mentioned to you early in one of my early lectures as a biochemist and very interested in the origin of life, uh, wrote his first book on the origin of life that came out in the 1980s. It's really a wonderful book. I can't remember the title of it. Uh, but one of the things he did was say, okay, let's take a genome of a microorganism and let's try to make it just randomly with the information that it has. Uh, and he tried to do that and he came up with an E. coli genome taking about 10 to the 40th years to make. So you're not going to do this just you know, one gene at a time or one fit gene at a time. It's not going to happen. What you want is a lot of experiments going on in the given region and then selection and, uh, and, and, and some way to actually transfer uh, genes that work into other organisms. And that's why we look at this horizontal gene transfer as being absolutely important for, for bi unity of biochemistry and for building the genome. And then we think that multicellularity and social behavior developed in the early biofilms. So this is why we're excited about studying these things. We, I think we have a, in my own head, I think we have some kind of a model to look at these early things. A paper came out in 2008 in PNAS in which Carl Woese, that I mentioned to you before, and a postdoc of Nigel Goldenfeld wrote a just purely theoretical paper, a modeling paper, and they found that horizontal gene transfer among cells within a biofilm can introduce and stabilize gene diversity. And we've since then actually showed that, so from models to actually experiments. So is the best, is the Lost City biofilm a possible model for testing the hypotheses that I just ran into? Now it's time. So, so going back to the biofilm, uh, again, the two different groups, what we found again in summary is a single species, it belongs to a group of methane uh, metabolizing organisms called the Methanosarsenales. The Methanosarsenales is unlike the, most of the other methanogens because it can not only produce methane, it has the ability under some of the strains to oxidize methane when coupled with a sulfate reducing a, a microorganism. So the very first anaerobic methane oxidizers that were ever found were found in somewhere in the early 2000s and that was a methanosarsenales. The other thing about the methanosarsenales, they can make methane from acetate, uh, whereas most methanogens can't do that. So the acetate is a two-carbon acid. Most of the organisms that, you know, using molecular methods greater than 85% were essentially look like a single species. So, <clears throat> So what we're going to be looking at, some of the characteristic velocity biofilm would have to have to fit this hypothesis is does it have multicellular characteristics? So the first thing we did is look at genetic diversity. We were missing something in the old techniques that we were using. Does it have multiple physiologies and metabolisms even though it's a single species? And what do we see when we do electron microscopy on the biofilm? Do we see something that looks the same or do we see some differences? And then also do we see evidence of horizontal gene transfer? I may mention uh, there are three known mechanisms and uh, in addition to conjugation where two cells come together and exchange material, there's a, a method called transformation where microbes can actually take up DNA from the environment and incorporate it. And that's something that goes on in biofilms. Transduction is vi virus-mediated genetic transfer. So microbes have three ways to gain completely new information. So test one, genetic diversity. The usual molecular methods that most people use and we use uh, only detected one species. So in this study, which was in 2009, we applied a method that had just come online. There was only one instrument in the country to do this work. This was supported by the Census of Marine Life. Uh, 
It's uh, an amazing method. I, I'll take a minute to explain this. The older methods require that you take DNA out of, out of a community and then you uh, PCR it. In other words, you use polymerase chain reaction to make a bazillion copies of what's there, uh, of the gene that you're interested in. And then you take that DNA and you put it into DNA. Because you have a big gamish, there's no way to know how much diversity you have. So you let microbes do that. So what we do, well, I mentioned transformation, where we can get DNA inserted into a cell. That's what we do. We insert the DNA into a cell. And then the cell makes multiple copies of it. And then we take that piece of DNA out of the cell after it makes multiple copies of that and sequence it. Now that is really tedious. So to do this on two or three hundred E. coli is lots of time and lots of expense. But this new method, uh, which is which is used, uses microfluidics, is that you can extract the DNA and then uh, each DNA goes into a well with your primer that for the specific gene sequence that you want. And typically you can have between 100,000 and a million of these little wells going on. So you just now orders of magnitude more sequencing. And since you, you are using this microfluor, ah, I don't know why I can't say that, fluoritics, uh, using a fluorescent type dye on the nucleotide basis that can incorporate it, you get direct reads of the sequence from up to a million of these. So you have suddenly you have all this data you know, that you have to deal with. Uh, so our first study is that uh, we looked at a couple of different kinds of, of, of chimneys, exterior, interior, uh, venting at different temperatures and a non-venting uh, cooler one that was dying down. And we use age as a proxy for environmental conditions. So when they're first formed, they're very porous, and that, uh, the, the form of calcium carbonate is an aragonite, very porous. And as they age, they become less porous, and the chemistry is, is much more hit by uh, seawater. So this is a, you know, like a 100,000-year-old structure. Uh, using uranium-thorium isotope systematics, you can measure the time since the carbonate precipitation uh, formed. So. Our first question was, how do microbial communities differ in young and old minerals? And this is what we did. We got a sample that was 40 years old, 100 years old, 30 years old, and 1,200 years old. And we applied this new next generation 454 sequencing of the 16S ribosomal RNA. We were very excited about this. It was the first time event sample has ever been done with this kind of, of, of method. It's obviously culture-independent analysis. Then we compared the relative abundance of each DNA sequence across the different chimney samples. This was my student Billy's, one of his thesis papers. So to, before I start, because I, I don't want, trying, trying to give you, there's a few things that you should know. I'm going to use the term OTUs, that's operational taxonomic units. So what we do is we decide what percent relatedness of, let's say, the 16S ribosomal RNA can give us a species. The general consensus is that if you are 97% or greater uh, relatedness in your RNAs, we call them the same species. That's sometimes correct, it's sometimes not. Uh, but it's actually pretty close. And then as you get lower percent, if you go down to 93 and 94, you're actually usually into completely different genera. So operational taxonomic units that I will use is at the 97% cutoff for species. We don't have to worry about ITS. The hypervariable regions are the regions in the 16S RNA that actually give you the diversity. So one of the beauties of this, this molecule RNA is it has very conserved sequences across every domain. So uh, E. coli in your gut and archaea and you share the same sequences, uh, conserved sequences. That's why this works. And then I mentioned horizontal gene transfer already. And so I thought I'd show you a picture of the 16S ribosomal RNA, which 
uh, sort of color-coded. The red are, are the variable regions, and there's nine of them. And these nine variable regions are where we get the diversity index. This is what it's all about. Some other regions, like the green ones, are extremely conserved. Every organism has them. Uh, and even the orange ones uh, are highly conserved, but there's a little bit of variation. But most of our phylogeny comes from those nine hypervariable regions. Those are the regions that, that actually do most of the mutation. And those are the regions we targeted in this, in this study. So I'm only going to show you one piece of data. Uh, the OTUs uh, looking at differences of beyond the 97%, you'll see that uh, in the three samples, 30, 40, 100, is still dominated by one uh, microbe. As you get into the lower numbers, this is you know 94 here, but you can get down into 5, 6%, you start seeing a lot of, uh, of 16S that we never measured using the old methods. And right here is 97%. But all of this are completely different OTUs. They're out of the bounds of 97. So there's 536 uh, groups of 16S ribosomal RNA that are outside of the 97% species level. Some of these are down to actually 90% or 85%. And yet they're all they're most closely related to the methanosarsenales. So it shows this one group of organisms has radiated out into a lot of different <coughs> organisms, even though they're most closely related to themselves. And then for the first time we saw in the old ones a completely different clade of organisms in the old carbonate structures. And, and even though it was present here in very low numbers, it really took off. So what we can say is that there was a, a pretty much a complete shift in the community between 100 and 1,200 years old. And the population that dominates this 1,200 years is already present, although rare, in these other samples. So it's already pre-adapted to the conditions that might, you know, that might not occur for a thousand years. So you have already some indications that you have this sort of multicellularity going on, and that you already have strains that are not adapted, perhaps, to the conditions 30, 40 years old, but are same, somehow are surviving and can adapt to. Uh, other other conditions. So some questions that inspired that were inspired by these results that these organisms that are only abundant in a hundred year old chimneys are already present but rare in, uh, in young chimneys. Then how did they get there? Uh, this is a question that somebody asked me at dinner last night. Uh, uh, we don't know for sure. Uh, are all rare species the same? Uh, we actually don't know that. We don't know what they're actually doing. And then how long can an organism remain in the rare biosphere before it blooms or extincts? Could it be a thousand years, which is what we were looking at? Could it be a million years, which is the age of this area? Or, or could it be, I shouldn't say forever, but you know, could these communities be the natural way in which the communities are? And since this is a group of organisms that's very, very ancient, I mean, we're looking at a, a, a potential kind of community that's more than, you know, three and a half billion years old. And so I'm trying to see what it actually tells us. So anyway, does this diversity that we see in the genes translate into anything that these organisms can do? This is known as a, a physiological diversity. And, and so what we did was take a look at this organism. We were very interested to know what it does. Uh, and so the chimneys are consuming hydrogens and consuming methane. So on the last cruise that we had, we took samples and we put them in a microcosm, incubated anaerobically on shipboard uh, and up to as highest temperatures we can get and high pH for four to eight days and added C13 uh, bicarbonate and C13 methane. And so what we're looking at is methanogenesis and methane oxidation. Do, do they occur in this sample? And in fact, uh, methane production occurs and it's particularly very stimulated if you add hydrogen uh, in comparison to, to no hydrogen. <coughs> methane oxidation also occurred, but it also was very stimulated by hydrogen, which was completely counterintuitive. 
So this means that if methane production and oxidation were simply reverse reactions, so they hydrogen CO2 to methane or reverse, and hydrogen would not stimulate methane oxidation, as seen in figure B. So we kind of conclude that methane production and, uh, and oxidation are not in competition. The two reactions seem to be linked, though, in some way. Uh, another thing I just make a, 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 we've done some, what we call a metagenomic study on this biofilm that we try to look at all the genes that are found, and we found one fairly uh, prevalently that is called acetyl-CoA synthetase. It's the enzyme involved in utilizing acetate. So it's nothing. So this has the potential also to use acetate. Uh, so the conclusions regarding the lost city methane uh, cycle is an actively venting chimney biological contribution to methane signal in end member fluid is, is small. So what we do in measuring methane coming out of, out, out of this uh, we don't see a signal for, for, for methane production by, by organisms. It's drowned out by too much methane in the environment. Uh, nevertheless, this particular biofilm has the uh, potential to mediate both production and oxidation. Uh, so we don't know why we're, we're not seeing a signal. And I, I want to point out how difficult this is as a place to live. So this is the classic methane production uh, way it's done with CO2 and hydrogen, and this is the, the Gibbs free energy at standard temperatures, uh, uh, room temperature and standard pH. Uh, minus 131 is a lot of energy associated with that. Uh, if you do the same calculations at, at 90 degrees and pH 10, there's still a lot. But if you look at the fact that you're at pH 9 and 10, then you don't have much CO2. So you measure the CO2 and it's so little that the energy available from this limiting substrate is very little. If we go back down to here and we look at the level of CO2 to support 10 to the ninth cells, which is what we have in this system, it would take 500,000 years for them to double with that small amount of CO2. So we start looking at other things. This is acetate and formate, and we get a little bit better here that we're into 60, 100 days, for example. If we could couple it with sulfate reduction and methane oxidation, it's even a little bit better. However, there's no evidence for that going on. I just want to point out how complicated these systems can be and, and trying to figure them out. So is there another way to make a living? And one of the ones that we're, we think we have uh, is that in forming, <clears throat> in making methane and in oxidizing methane, because this is a biofilm, the CO2 liberated by methane oxidation goes immediately into a methanogen cell because they're together. The CO2 doesn't escape. It just gets produced and channels through the next organism. And we have some evidence that that's going on. So it may very well be, this is a, a very unique system where uh, something we never have predicted that something that can oxidize methane, the CO2 is used to make methane and, and hydrogen is, is available. So, so further evidence for multicellularity are the morphology of the cells and the presence of multiple genes that perform one function, and those are nitrogen-fixing <coughs> genes. And I'll just show you pictures. This is a, a transmission electron micrograph of thin section of the lost city biofilm. And you can see lots of different morphologies, even though this is the same organism. Uh, they're very bizarre, and they're surrounded all in this polysaccharide matrix. But if you just highlight this right here, you'll see that there's all even further differences. You can see here there's multiple membranes. This has never been seen in an archaea, let alone a methanogen. But if you, there's two groups of organisms, one that oxidizes methane with oxygen, and the other one that oxidizes ammonia with oxygen, and they both have multiple membranes like this. So this, this is a some evidence that maybe this group is oxidizing methane and some of these others aren't. Uh, this is just, we haven't proven that, but this is the first time these kind of membranes have been seen in a, and certainly in an archaea. And I just want to point out, which is phenomenal, that we thought we had a single species, the genes involved in nitrogen fixation are over 20 sequences found in this biofilm. They're all archaea. This was done also by a former student of mine. Uh, 
So I think the last piece of evidence that I want to get into is horizontal gene transfer. And so again, I told you we got this metagenomic study where we looked at all the genes from a lost city biofilm. And we found a high incidence of what is called transposases. What are these? Anybody know what these are? You do. Good. Mm -hmm. so I'll, I'll point out, these are enzymes that bind to the ends of a transposon, which are DNA that can jump around in other positions on the genome. And they catalyze the movement of the transposon to another part of the genome by a cut and paste mechanism. Actually, uh, Barbara McClintock got the, uh, a Nobel Prize for finding out this jumping genes were going on in corn. So, I mean, this was a big, big finding at the time it happened. Uh, they can cause mutations and change the amount of DNA in the genome. The transposase sequences in the lost city biofilm appear to be viral. Uh, so, again, indicating that they may be really high incident. But how much is there? This is what really blew us away. Uh, this is every single metagenome that's been done on an environmental sample. The lost city chimney with the really low diversity, 8% of all the reads, 8% of all the genes are transposases. The next best is in a sludge, which has a bazillion different kinds of species. It's an order of magnitude less. So uh, the lost city ch chimney contains 10 times more of these transposases than any other metagenome, and they're primarily viral. So, uh, so as kind of a summary, the archaea and the bacteria in the lost city chimney shift between rare and dominant. They may be involved in both uh, oxidation and, and and, and methane and making it, and then lateral gene transfer has to be playing a, a fairly big role. And as I said, I, I don't want to underestimate the role. And the same species that dominated a lost city for more than 100,000 years, and this is a special ecosystem that could reveal much about hydrothermal vent ecology, microbial species, speciation, and, uh, and especially new mechanisms for uh, cooperative metabolism multicellularity. The microbial species thing, the lost city is the best site so far to try to understand what is kind of the new findings of the last few years, and that is the majority of microorganisms in the ocean are rare. They exist in, in, at levels that we've never measured before. And that's why I can say with, with all confidence there's more than a billion species of microorganisms based on that 97% cutoff in OTUs with 99.9% we know nothing about. Most are rare, and we don't know why they're rare, and we don't know what they're doing. The lost city is the best example that maybe organisms live in communities that over time uh, changes, whether they be short time or long time, would favor a certain group of, of microorganisms. What has also come out of this is what I call genetic memory, which I think is really important. They're, we're starting to build evidence that microbes even left over from different periods in ocean history that had radical different changes in conditions than today, those genes are still preserved in organisms today. So if we know how to actually go after them, yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to basically end by going back to this and say as a lost city biofilm, is there any relationship to LUCA? Uh, what I was talking about. Uh, again, it does use, it does use hydrogen. Uh, we think that this sort of metabolic network that methanogens use is something that we want to study as an early form of metabolism. Uh, horizontal gene transfer, I said, is necessary, and we see that in big time in this particular biofilm. We don't know what it's doing yet. That's something we have to <coughs> go into. And whether or not the multicellularity we see actually has form sensing and other factors that I mentioned to you about that could be have social behavior implications we haven't tested yet. This is sort of a new model and lots of sort of new data. So I'll end with this that the lost city uh, biofilm is a possible model for early life. Again, hydrogen production, uh, low archaeal diversity, one dominant phylotype, multiple physiologies, differentiation into sub populations, horizontal gene transfer, and rare species become dominant, so you already have a community already programmed for changing environmental conditions. And I think that's it.
some measure where you can measure the evolutionary age of those biofilms or the relatedness between different biofilms? If we, <coughs> what we can actually do, and we haven't done that yet, because even though we, we got the metagenome to hopefully to be able to take a number of genes and do what we call cogging them, and that is compare them with you know, other sequences of the same gene and follow them down to the, the early ancestors. And we haven't been able to do that yet, but uh, where we have been able to do it is with the nitrogen fixing genes. I, you know, I mentioned my student Mosme Metha, who her real big find, which, which was phenomenal, we, uh, nitrogen fixation up to her work had the highest temperature was 60 degrees. And most people working with nitrogen fixation, because many people have tried to find it, have never, didn't think it would ever be beyond 60 degrees. So Mosby found a vent methanogen, a methane producer, that fixed nitrogen at 92 degrees. It's unrelated to this organism, but it fixed 92. That particular protein, going back to what you said, turns out to be the mother of all nitrogenases. It's the oldest one of all. And, and uh, you know, my colleague Bob Blankenship pretty much places it in before the separation of the three domains. And I mentioned to you before, the first metal sulfur protein involved in photosynthesis came from this nitrogen fixing. Well, anyway, in Lost City, even though it's a different organism, different kind of methanogen, the, the genes are you know, more than 95 to 97 percent related to the, the high temperature one. Uh, so, you know, in that sense, you know, it's, it's still looking at a very ancient archaeal type of, of, uh, of enzyme. But we haven't, this is, we haven't even published this stuff yet. This is still stuff that we're, we're, we're working on. Yeah, I don't think we, re we really know too much. What we, what we see a lot of these transposes, transposases are is they're most related to retroviruses. So they're most, you know, if we go into retroviruses, which are like the AIDS virus and the RNA viruses that produce a lot of this stuff, uh, the sequences the sequences on these transposases match up better with RNA retroviruses than with anything else. So I don't know what that means. Is that a remnant of the RNA world too? It's one of the things that we're very excited about. Are there a lot of RNA viruses associated with this and what do they look like? And some of you know that your chromosome is mostly retroviral RNA. I mean, a human chromosome has, has, has really been blasted by RNA viruses. And in some cases, they just hang around their selfish genes, as they've been called. But in other cases, they've not been so selfish. The human uterus came from an RNA virus, the genes involved in that. It's kind of interesting. Uh, so what, el what else has come from that, I don't know. And you know, building our genome is kind of interesting. So it points out how little we know about building complexity in, let's say, a, a higher organism genome when you're already blasted with you know, uh, retroviruses and, and genes from all over the place. So I'll show you, make, um, if I get to talk about symbiosis, I'll talk to you about some of the new things that are coming out on symbiosis to point out that essentially the model that we use for the origin of eukaryotes is still going on today. We still have evidence of exactly those mechanisms that make a eukaryote from a microorganism is still going on today. Genes that are transferred by transposons are they identified? What? Not in what? Now this is this, this is a really complicated issue because we can't grow this organism, so we have to rely on getting to the site and working with it. It's too complicated. We've tried to grow, and we've run out of samples, so we have to go back and uh, and that's certainly one of the things we're going to do. I mean, we're going to hit that really big time on the next cruise. I think I should let Jonathan get this thing started. <coughs>